If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to answer this question on your own before listening on. As a preliminary step to solving this question, we're going to make the direction that's clockwise positive. That's a bit unconventional. Usually in physics, clockwise is a negative value for an angle, but in this problem, we're just going to call it positive. And as we'll see, that will allow us to keep all the angular velocities as well as angles positive. It just makes things a little bit simpler. So we'll keep that convention in mind. And then we're going to break this problem up into separate phases. In phase one, the block is going to slide down this frictionless surface until it reaches the very bottom. And we're going to use conservation of energy to determine the final speed of the block once it reaches the bottom of this surface. So let's go ahead and set up the conservation of energy. Note that initially the only energy present is the gravitational potential energy, and then once it slides down the ramp, all of that energy will be converted into kinetic energy. So we'll set those two energies equal to each other. For the kinetic energy, we can use 1 half times mass times speed squared, and the gravitational potential energy will be the mass times g times the height. Mass appears on both sides of the equation, so we can cancel it, and then we'll multiply both sides of the equation by 2, so that we can then take the square root and isolate the final speed. We can plug in 9.8 for g as well as the initial height. Just make sure you convert that into meters. And so this expression right here becomes the speed of the block once it reaches the bottom of the surface. That completes phase one. We can note that that speed is the square root of 2gh. And then we're going to move on to phase two of the problem in which the collision of this small block and the rod takes place. And during that collision, we're going to conserve momentum, specifically angular momentum. So let's set up the conservation of angular momentum next. And so we have the initial angular momentum equaling the final angular momentum. Now for our initial scenario, we're going to imagine the block just sliding along the surface, not yet colliding with the rod. And so the initial angular momentum of the rod will be zero, but that of this block can be represented by the angular momentum of a particle. Now the angular momentum of a particle would be given by the mass of the particle times its speed times a distance d. Now we're going to call the distance d the distance from the pivot all the way to where the particle is located. Note that your textbook gives the angular momentum of a particle as r times mass times v perpendicular. Well, because the particle here is moving in this manner to the left, note that your textbook gives the angular momentum of a particle as r times m times v times the sine of an angle, whereas we're using this expression mvd, so that warns a little bit of an explanation. The r is simply the distance from the pivot to the particle, and in our case we're calling that d. m is the mass, v would be the speed, and then this angle phi right here would be the angle between the velocity vector and the line that connects the particle to the pivot. And hopefully we can see in this diagram that that angle would be 90 degrees. And of course the sine of 90 is just 1, so that term actually drops out. So what we're left with is actually r times m times v, but we're just arbitrarily calling the distance d rather than r. And that's where that d times m times v appears in our initial angular momentum for the particle. Now, once the block collides with the rod and sort of sticks to it, the two objects together are going to start to rotate in a circular fashion. So on the final side for the final angular momentum, we would have the rotational inertia of the two objects that are kind of stuck together multiplied by the angular velocity. Now we're going to expand the rotational inertia to include the rotational inertia of the block plus the rotational inertia of the rod. The block being a particle would have a rotational inertia equal to mass times distance squared. Remember the distance would be from the particle to the rotational axis. For the rod it's a bit more complicated. So for now we'll sort of put a question mark there but we want to come up with an expression for the rotational inertia of the rod. We know from our textbooks that when we have a rod that's rotating about an axis that goes right through its center of mass, then the rotational inertia is simply equal to 1 12th times the mass times the length of the rod squared. 
However, we can see from the diagram that this rod is not rotating about its center of mass. It's rotating about 0.0. But luckily, the so-called parallel axis theorem is going to allow us to compensate for the difference in the rotational axis. We know that according to the parallel axis theorem, the rotational inertia would equal the rotational inertia about the center of mass plus the mass of the object times this term h squared. Now h would simply be the distance from the center of mass to the new rotational axis. And hopefully we can see from the diagram that that value for h would simply be half of the overall length of the rod. In other words, the h would be d divided by 2. So the parallel axis theorem would become i about the center of mass plus m times d divided by 2 squared. But let's remember the rotational inertia about the center of mass is given by this expression, 1 12th mass times length squared. So we can plug that in here. And so this becomes the rotational inertia of the rod that we need to plug into our conservation of angular momentum formula. So here we have the conservation of angular momentum expanded out a little bit here. Let's not forget that this term v right here, that was the initial velocity or the magnitude of the initial velocity of the block just as it had reached the bottom of that surface and it was equal to the square root of 2gh. So we're going to fill that in for v as well. We can also simplify the terms inside the parentheses, particularly these two, because they're like terms. We can square the d over 2 to make d squared over 4. And then we can add together the 1 12th md squared plus this 1 4th md squared. And then we'll have the 1 3rd md squared right here. So now we can go ahead and divide both sides by the term in parentheses so we can isolate this angular velocity. And then we can move on to phase 3 of the problem. Now here we have the rod with the block stuck to its bottom and they're both moving and rotating about this pivot O up here. And so at that moment we would have rotational kinetic energy. And then as the rod swings up to its maximum height, all of that rotational kinetic energy is going to be converted back into gravitational potential energy. And through the conservation of energy, we can set those two energies equal to one another. Now rotational kinetic energy is equal to one half times the rotational inertia. Now let's keep in mind there's two rotational inertias again. There's the one for the rod plus the one for the particle, which we've called md squared. So it's one half times the total rotational inertia times the angular speed squared. So we'll go ahead and set that equal to the gravitational potential energy. And we will note that there will be two gravitational potential energies. There's going to be one for the block itself, which we'll just call mass times g times a height h. And we've labeled that height over here. That is simply the height to which the block will rise. And then we're going to have a second gravitational potential energy of the rod itself, which will be capital M times g and the center of mass of the rod is only going to rise to a height of half of that height h. And that might be a little bit tricky. Perhaps we can briefly try to explain why that is. Let's just imagine that the rod hangs straight down and on its end we have the block. And then they collide and they swing upward, perhaps like this. Now the center of the mass of the rod would be located right here. And we're calling this height h. Now, we could maybe explain it this way. Any point that's located right here would rise to the height h, just like the block is. But any point that's only halfway down the rod, halfway down the length of the rod, would only end up rising by half of the amount. Similarly, if there was a point that was only a third of the way down the rod, maybe like right here, then it would only rise by a height that would be h over 3, and, and so on. So, so long as we assume the center of mass of the rod is located in its geometrical center, that means it's halfway down the length of the rod and it will only rise to a height that's half of that. Height to which the block is rising. Now we'll go back to our expression for the angular velocity and what we'll do is we'll square both sides of it. And the reason we want to do that is because in our conservation of energy equation, we have omega squared. So if we square both sides, we would have omega squared. This denominator would become squared. The numerator, every term would get squared. So we would end up with m squared here, d squared, and then this square root would cancel away. We'll then take this expression for omega squared and we'll plug it into our conservation of energy equation.
Now we can see, sort of conveniently, we have a term in parentheses here, and then this is actually the same term. If you look carefully, they're both the total rotational inertias, right? We have the rotational inertia of the block and then the rotational inertia of the rod, and that's what we have down here, the rotational inertia of the block, the rotational inertia of the rod. And so actually, because we have a factor in the numerator and a factor in the denominator, we can actually cancel this one out and just call this power of one. Now we still have a little bit of work cut out for us because we don't even have the angle present in our equation here. And the question is asking for that angle. So that's our next goal is to try to get the angle incorporated into our formula here. And so to find the angle, we can redraw the picture just one more time. Here's the rod hanging straight down. Here's the rod after it has swung to its height with a little block attached to it. This would be the angle theta. We recall that we called this distance right here D. This distance here is also D because it's the entire length of the rod. Notice that if we draw a line sort of right across here, this length right here, because it's adjacent to the angle that's marked theta, that would be D times the cosine of theta. What we are seeking here is an expression for capital H. We know from earlier that the block will rise to a capital H. Hopefully we can see from this diagram that capital H would simply be this length right here, which is D, minus this length right here, which is D cosine theta. So if we subtracted D and D cos theta, that would give us the height H. We want to get a little fancy here. We can factor the D out, and then we would have 1 minus cos theta. So we're going to substitute this expression in for the height H. We could then factor out the D times 1 minus cos theta, since that's included in this term and the second term. And in fact, we notice inside the brackets, they actually both contain G. So we actually could have factored that out. Why don't we go ahead and factor out that G? And that way it would cancel inside these brackets here. Now, if we look on the left and right hand sides, we can see that we have a factor of D right here and D squared. So we can actually divide both sides of the equation by D so that that D goes away and this just becomes D to the first power. And then that factor of G can also divide out because we have one right there and then one right there. So we can get rid of that and that. And we're still working towards solving for the angle. Why don't we divide this bl black bracketed term over to the left hand side. We could then subtract one from both sides. Divide both sides by negative one. So this term would become negative. This becomes positive and this becomes positive. And then finally take the inverse cosine. We're now ready to plug in the known values. I'm sure this could be simplified further, but we've probably had enough at this point. Remember that little m is the mass of the small block. Capital M is the mass of the rod. We have the little h height of 20 centimeters. We can call that 0.2 meters. And then we have the length. Remember, we call the length d, and that'll be 0.40 meters. Convert the masses also into kilograms. And when you compute that, you should get approximately 32 degrees. So this would be the final answer.